Good morning, everybody. Before I begin, I just need to ask, is there someone here who knows how to light the candles? If you know who you are, we're going to need you when we come to the peace, OK? Just, just know we need those candles lit at the peace. All right. We just heard another of the parables from Matthew's Gospel, and there are a lot of different kinds of parables in Matthew's Gospel. Sometimes they sound like a great metaphor, a whole world of meaning that we're trying to line up with our own experience and figure out sort of what it's supposed to mean for us. Sometimes they sound like a recitation of current events or some kind of uncanny insight into the world we live in today. Sometimes the parables sound like comedy, and sometimes they sound like tragedy. This morning's story falls on my ears like that, like a genuine tragedy. It is the tragedy of a missed opportunity to live into the way of love, the tragedy of failing to share what has been shared with us, which comes from our forgetfulness of all that we have received. This old story of the master and the slaves is so familiar to us, it is far too easy to miss its power. So let's just start by recalling the basic points of the story. At the center of the story are power relationships. There is someone who is described as a king, in the Greek, a basileia, or later a lord, a kyrios and two people who are described in a subservient role, a doulon in the Greek, a slave or a servant. And then there are the debts that are owed. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the exchange rate between euros and denarii and talents, let me just help you out here. One denarius was a day's wages, a talent was the equivalent of 6,000 days wages, or somewhere between 16 and 20 years of wages. All right, now in Germany, the standard working year is 230 days. And as of last year, the average wage in Germany is 45,457 euros. That means the average daily wage in Germany last year was 198 euros. So that means of the two debts mentioned in this story, the one owed by that second servant to his fellow servant, 100 denarii, was 100 daily wages, or 19,800 euros. But the one owed by that first servant, 10,000 talents, or 10,000 times 6,000 daily wages, well, it, it was a big number. <laughs> okay, I know you want to know, right? All right, it was 11,858,347,826 euros. So what we're talking about in rough terms, right, is a debt of 20,000 euros and a debt of 12 billion euros. We're talking about one debt that is 600,000 times smaller than the other, a debt that is unimaginably large and a debt that is heavy but manageable. That is how all of this fell on the ears of the people who heard this story from Jesus. And they must have asked themselves, how on earth could that king have allowed that person to accumulate such a debt? Talk about bad management. But of course, the whole point of the story is not about money, right? And we live in Frankfurt. We live in the banking center of Europe. We live in the home of the European Central Bank. We think in quantitative terms about everything. But in this story, the money, the stuff you can count, is not the point. It's just a clue. It's a clue to what the point is. It's a clue to the depth of sin to which all of us, all of us are liable. A depth that is exceeded only by the outrageous extent of the mercy 
of which God is capable. The king calls in that first servant and says, look, I'm calling in the loan. If you can't pay it, I will destroy you. You and your family and everything you are and love about. As Jesus tells the story, his audience would think, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds like the justice we've learned about in the old stories. The servant falls on his knees and asks for a workout deal. Look, he says, you trusted me with this much. Okay, some of my investments did not work out, but I can manage my way out of this. Doesn't this sound a little bit like some of the CEOs we've heard about recently? Doesn't this sound a little bit like, do you remember some of these names? Elizabeth Holmes or Sam Bankman fried or Kenneth Lay or, I don't know, any of the directors of Credit Suisse? But then something happens. The text says the king is moved to pity. In the beautiful language of the authorized version, it says the king is moved to compassion. And he says something that Jesus' audience would have been completely blown away by. What he says is, just forget about it. Forget about the doubt. Let's just forget about the 12 billion euros. It's okay, just erase it. Let's move on from here. Now let me say this again. This is not a story about money. This is a story about our capacity for causing injury to other human beings that imposes a cost, a degree of damage that is almost beyond imagining. Not one of us, not one of us is somehow incapable of causing that kind of injury, whether by intention or neglect or accident or oversight. All of us, each of us is capable of suddenly finding that we have accumulated a debt from hurting someone else or some group of other people that we cannot possibly hope to repay, a debt that is utterly beyond our ability to rectify. Now, if I were a New England preacher of 200 years ago, this is the point of the sermon at which I would remind you, brothers and sisters, that you and I have already accumulated exactly that unimaginable debt. And each of us has already been forgiven that debt by the life, passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, by the mercy of God, by the work of the cross. So here is the situation of that first servant. He has accumulated an unforgivable debt. He cannot possibly repay it. He has been faced with the very real prospect of utter and justified destruction, and it has all been forgiven. All of it just swept away. Why isn't that the best possible news? Why is this story a tragedy? Well, for the simple reason that for some reason, that first servant, that forgiven servant, does not believe in his own forgiveness. He cannot accept that it has happened. He cannot face what it means, what it has to mean for his own life. And so when someone else who owes him a debt, a debt that is a trifle compared to his own, he cannot connect the mercy that has been given to him with any mercy extended to someone else. He doesn't get it. The fact that he has been forgiven something so unimaginably large to him is unimaginable. That is the deepest sort of tragedy. Because in the end, it is a failure of both imagination and humility. 
It is a lost opportunity, an, an opportunity for showing love that is lost in a colossal failure of self-awareness. And my sisters and brothers, more often than not, more often than we would care to admit, that is our circumstance too. We don't believe in our own forgiveness. Just maybe because we don't really believe we need to be forgiven. It's hard to face into our own forgiveness, the forgiveness that we have already received, because we cannot do so without taking full account of the wrongs we have done. And we sure as heck would rather not do that. We sure would prefer to avoid self-examination. Thank you very much. We would much prefer to examine and judge others. We're much better at that. But you know, that is the absolute requirement of full discipleship in Christ. We cannot be disciples without first, last, and always being engaged in the discipline of self-examination. Because that is the only way that we can finally begin to glimpse just how much has been done for us by the love of God. And only then, only then can we walk in that way of love, let alone guide others along the path with us. If we fully faced into our own forgiveness, if we fully faced into our own need to be forgiven, and the forgiveness we have already received from God, how could we possibly be as resentful as we sometimes are? How could we possibly be as petty as small, as intolerant, as impatient as we sometimes are. We can't begin to show true forgiveness unless we are first prepared to receive, really receive the forgiveness that we have been given. And we can't begin to receive that forgiveness unless we're prepared to accept, really accept, just how deeply, how profoundly each of us, for our own reasons, our own errors, stands in the need of the mercy God has already shown us. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, remember that Jesus does not, does not teach them to say, forgive those who have sinned against us as you have forgiven us. No, 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 no. What he teaches them is this. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. Our Presbyterian friends would want us to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Something about how our salvation gets worked out depends on our ability to forgive others. And that, in turn, depends on our ability to accept the forgiveness we have been given. So much of our lives depends on our ability to face into our mercy, the mercy we've been given, to accept it on God's terms and not on our own. So much of our life in community together depends on our capacity for forgiving each other, me included. And we cannot make even a beginning of that until we have accepted the forgiveness we've already received. And so, and so, may our merciful God, who has given us so much, give us yet one thing more, the courage to face our need for forgiveness, the willingness to accept it fully, and the grace to offer it just as generously as it has been given to us, to everyone with whom we share this journey. Amen.